Thank you very much for the opportunity to have this very important discussion with you this afternoon. And I must say, let me start off with some mixed feelings and mixed emotions. Coming to speak to you as a lawyer and with a family which is firmly rooted in accounting and auditing. Um, we come from a rules-based family where rules help regulate society. And yet, today we stand in this particular avenue where we're actually drowning in exactly that. We're at the point where we don't quite know where it is that we're supposed to go. We're too afraid to make decisions, and yet that inaction is simply something which we cannot sustain any longer. So, an interesting point, and it's interesting, it's a pity that the Deputy Minister has now already left us, but we had a visiting professor, um, Advocate Bim Trengrove, Senior Counsel, who gave a talk on OPE Investments versus the Minister of uh, Finance, and the talk was entitled, Is Government at War with the Banks? The interesting thing that he started off with his opening remarks is the fact that that was an entire courtroom filled with no less than more than 15 senior counsel plus junior counsel, excluding all the attorneys. Does anyone have any idea the collective billing hours of that exercise? <laughs> now, he said that's great for lawyers. My question is, but can the country continue to afford it? Can we continue to afford making these mistakes and these experiments? So, if we could start with the presentation. Unfortunately, my colleague, Eva Christen from the Business School, couldn't join us today because he is delivering another presentation in Durban. But this is really a collaboration between the Faculty of Law and the Rhodes Business School as a consequence of part of what we um, have envisaged as part of our transformation program at Rhodes University. Both of us are members of the Institutional Forum of Rhodes, and as part of our interesting history of the last two years that we've all engaged in, Rhodes particularly also with the sexual violence process in 2015, and then of course the Fees Must Fall protests, we actually were in our Transformation Summit, which actually took place over three days and turned into, and that wasn't necessarily just the intention, but a very constructive strategic plan. And part of this that we're discussing today was born as a consequence of that particular engagement. Firstly, we must remember that this doesn't operate in isolation. Firstly, that we are also already secretaries to a UN Sustainable Development Goals Program, as signed as early as 2015, not to mention the fact that there's the African Development Program of 2030, and of course, the NDP, sorry, that we, we, we talked about this morning. The interesting thing that all of these aspects have in common is the fact that we talk about the concept of value creation that is to be accomplished in a sustainable manner. And this concept of sustainability is something which Rose has chosen to adopt as our way future. Everything that we question now has to be with that particular lens. Interestingly enough, I bet you I'm speaking to the converted in this room. How often have you gone to academics raising these particular issues? And academics have turned to you and said, no, but I teach. My objective is to do research and community engagement. I already do so much. This is beyond my purview. This is not my interest or expertise. But well, I'm here to tell you that that's not the way forward. And that's not the way that we can continue to do business. Interestingly enough, we now live in an era where, yes, there are the disruptors. Yes, there is Uber. Let's not go into the subtleties and the challenges that they're facing right now. But we're also dealing with issues around the fact that the very concept of knowledge, creation, the sharing of information, what we consider private and secret is changing rapidly in ways that we can't even begin to predict. In fact, law is having to catch up constantly to keep up with the changing natures of society. In this particular interest, what I want to underscore before we even get into the discussion around issues from procurement, and something which we seem to forget, is the fact that we have stakeholders, that we have key interested parties who have a right to hold us to account. And we see this now, particularly with the student movements, but it goes beyond that. We see it in the transformation of how the Department of Trade and Industry has changed since 2004 to move towards decriminalizing the corporate landscape, to how the King Codes of Corporate Governance have changed from one, two, three, and four. When I had dinner with Mervyn King about two years ago, just before the launch of the new principles of King Four, 
And it's interesting, of course, that he took all those many principles and he reduced them. And he said, one of the things I asked him was, you know, well, what is, the, what is what, as the heart and soul of what it is that you think corporate governance is about? What would you, how would you distill that information? And he spoke about the concept of fiduciary duties. Now, fiduciary duties, if you speak to law students and you speak to people in practice, can be a very complex idea. And we talk about disclosure, and we talk about conflicts of interest, and we talk about the common law versus the partial codification of the Companies Act, and then lawyers will critique how the Companies Act has failed us. He said this. Imagine that you are somebody who is looking after a dearly beloved member of your family. That member of your family is in a coma. They cannot look after themselves, they can't make any personal decisions about their health, their wealth, their finance. It all rests on you. How would you care for that loved one? That is how he defines fiduciary duties. Now, when it comes to our dynamic as a good corporate citizen, which of course is implied in our constitution, our fiduciary duties are to our institutions. And through the success of our institutions, we will then also benefit all the other parties and stakeholders. So, are we acting in the best interest of our organizations? Well, why is supply chain management important in this particular conversation? Here are some of the obvious answers. It gains efficiencies from procurement. <laughs> it deals with logistics and distribution. We make efficient insourcing and outsourcing decisions. It sounds straightforward, but then again, look at these must fall. Why is it that they had to take that particular movement for us to start to question these particular patently obvious issues? How can we then be more efficient and was that the best way of doing it? If you look at how Rhodes, located in Grahamstown, is having to deal with this particular issue, when I first moved to Grahamstown, the economic and social divide could not be more blatant. If you are on the west and you have Rhodes sitting on a hill, you literally overlook the township. It's literally divided across a particular bowl. And that is like a microcosm of our society. How is it that that could still be in the 21st century? That is our role. It is not just the role of us in this particular room, but it's the role of academics, it's the role of institutions, it's the role of government, and it's the role of civil society. But we need to start working together to achieve those particular objectives. Because these particular challenges are not just a management issue. So, when it came to this issue about how to transform this concept of supply chain management, we looked at the issue around, yes, there's the issue of we must always reduce costs. I don't even want to ask how many people have had to been asked that question how many times this year, of how can we reduce costs? But at what cost can we continue to simply reduce costs? There has to be a balance that has to be struck between the reduction of costs and also with transforming institutions. Enter the third stream income. Anyone want to raise hands on how many people are currently working on various forms of third stream income generation? Okay. The question about this is how do we do so in an ethical and sustainable manner? How do we do so that also then speaks to the issue around our triple BEE and scorecards and ESD? What we're going to do, um, between myself and Yanis, directly after this, is we're going to then give you a very technical breakdown of exactly what that means. Literally looking at each particular university and its current status and ranking within the current system. Tomorrow what we intend to do is open the floor up to a workshop so we can have an active social engagement and problem solving opportunity as to how we can best improve the scorecards and our particular processes towards procurement, supply chains, management, and how it is that we have to actually take this home to our various structures. What we did as a consequence of this is the fact that it is not simply, and we've heard this echo the entire morning, this is beyond tick box. This is not a nice to have. The consequences for poor performance on this is real. If we as institutions feel the pinch of a lack of flow for higher education coming to us from the state, I'm warning you now that as a consequence of a poor scoring, we will have even less funding. That is where it's going to hit us. So transformation for transformation's sake is one thing, 
or we have to also do it in a manifest way that truly makes material gain and worth. So in that particular instance, part of the challenge is the fact that we have issues around finance and costs when it comes to increased financial volatility. In this particular instance, is that that's going to discourage people from entering into a particular market. And it limits the particular pool of people who also are able to actually, if they don't have, basically, wealth of, inf of information, money, expertise, and capital, that this actually excludes people from the market. So this is something we have to look at when we are serious about actually engaging with small to medium enterprises. Also, what about the cost of the particular pressure? Do people fully understand how it is that they have to engage with this particular dynamic? And how do we then actually source public funding, and perhaps even as universities, through the business schools, through other engagements and opportunities, actually educate local communities to engage in this particular process, so that they can enter the formal sector? Well, here we are, we sit, and we, in theory, have all the expertise in the room. We are the experts. We are the ones with high levels of skills. In theory, we're the ones with the high levels of employment. However, we also recognize the fact that, at the moment, South Africa is literally bleeding skilled people. How do we stem that? And part of this particular issue is the fact that, and this is once again this cost-benefit scenario, is we're asking the question that we can't afford salaries within higher education for these academics. The question, of course, is those people are going to leave the public sector and enter the private sector. And we need those experts in order to train the people of the future. So limited supplier pools is another great challenge. In this particular instance, this is where we would encourage a deeper and more concrete relationship with PERCO. We cannot operate in isolation, not just of each other, not as higher education institutions, but also within the structures and government departments. There is information available. We just need to tap into that and start sharing ideas. That is the only way we're actually going to move forward to manage the risk. So when it comes to shifting our priorities, here we have to look at the fact that, and we recognize that demands in higher education is going to be ceaseless. It is changing rapidly, dramatically, excitingly if you're an optimist. However, the issues around this is how do we actually quantify the fact that we have to manage those particular costs? And interestingly enough, how much of what we do is actually green, environmentally friendly? Remember that, of course, for those of us who are familiar with the King Codes of Corporate Governance, we also talk about triple bottom line approaching. The fact that we have to recognize the fact that we operate not just in an economic sphere, but a social sphere. And of course, what is our, what is our, what is our, our green footprint? How is it that we manage that in a way which also brings down those costs and also incre increases the efficiency of scale? So, one of the issues is that we could look at locally supported, uh, sourced apparel or goods. How much of that is actually taking place? I had an interesting question with the Department of Fine Art, because I was looking at the fact that we have to give gifts to all these visiting professors and academics that come to visit. Yet everything that we're giving them is pre-packaged, nothing is made domestically, and yet we have people in our communities that can provide exactly the kinds of tools, resources, and expertise that we would love to showcase. Why do we not support local? So, when it comes to the regulatory ra landscape, here, and this is going to be the interesting thing, the regulatory framework is frightening. I won't lie to you. And that's what we hope to dispel over the next two days. The consequences for not being compliant is going to be severe. At the moment, higher education institutions have actually been given basically a hall pass. And we've all been engaging in a process of transformation. That window is now closing. So when it comes to issues around the fact that we have to adapt and change, we have to now prove to the DTI and to other agents that we actually are meeting these particular targets. However, when it comes to commodity prices, particularly when it looks like a university like Rhodes or any other residential campus, certain supply goods and what have you are quite fixed. So when it comes to that, that will directly impact on your suppliers. So we have to look at that in a far more creative way to be able to find how it is that we can actually deal with this very real practical scenario. Interestingly enough, we've heard of the Triple BEE Commission. 
Do we know the powers and functions of this particular commission and the consequences of actually not being compliant? So as I said a little bit earlier, there was a move since 2004 towards decriminalization. I'm not entirely sure that that was necessarily a good move. I'm still mulling this over. Because instead of decrim well, well, you have seen decriminalization, except for section 332 of the Criminal Procedure Act, which should actually be unconstitutional, but that's another debate. The issue here is that we've actually seen various new commissions that have been created. So in other words, we have the Competition Commission, we have various other tribunals, various other regulatory agencies, all of which have been given more and more extensive power. The interesting thing about this, not only that they have the power to look at what we consider large transactions, which are around 25 million rand, is that what's more interesting is the fact that it will actually be able to review transactions. In other words, it will actually look in hindsight way back as 2014 when it comes to certain transactions that actually don't meet those requirements. And it will be able to reverse those transactions. That's a great deal of power. It gives you an idea of the sense of gravity of the situation that we're actually in at the moment. So in this particular instance, when it comes to rejecting those particular transactions, we now look at the fact that, well, who is now going to be accountable? Who must actually report to this particular commission? And how does the reporting take place? Well, interestingly enough, it's not just fears of government, as we've heard quite a bit about this morning, but also public entities or an organ of state. So here, even we, as higher education institutions, as public entities, would have to also provide audited reports and then detail our expenditure and how we meet these new obligations. Just note the time periods as well. We're now looking at 30 days of approval of audited financial statements. And violations occurring after 2014, but then of course looking at issues around periods around that, just then and, and, and uh, did licensing issues just prior to that, might also actually result in the fact that you might not even be able to trade. So not only would you suffer direct penalties, but you can actually stop trading if you are found in violation of these particular um, new I, and rather pivotal, actually, um, imports into the particular system. What is fascinating is that we also have to ask the question, well, who can actually lodge a particular complaint? Who is actually the one that can actually raise this particular issue? And uh, I must admit that one, this is one of the other issues that I have particular problems with, because whistleblowing in South Africa is already another issue. But let's leave that aside. It could be any other person who is either aware of or even suspects there may be a violation of the Act. And then, interestingly enough, here it includes employees in a particular entity, so it could be in that particular entity, and then particularly we're going to be looking at issues around fronting. Now, there's going to be, a, you've heard of fronting, and I think Yanis particularly we discuss is going to also mention the very important issue of trumping. Because the trumping provision is going to have serious ramifications in this particular arena. So fronting we're aware of, where people are literally actually literally coming together and actually creating these consortiums, but in effect it actually doesn't meet the requirements of the legislation or what government's directors actually are, and the consequences therefore. So when it comes to this, we must clearly know what the objectives of the legislation of the Act are. We cannot impede it in any particular form, and if we are, we are in violation, and then we will suffer the consequences. So basically, the consequences and the powers related to that would be the following. Is that, and look at this, it, it's not quite criminal, but look at the echoes. It can issue investigations looking at particular findings, make particular recommendations. It can even issue summons, and it can question any particular person it believes may be involved. Then it can even approach a court for a particular interdict, which in effect forces you to appear before a judge. Then it can still refer to the NPA, and you can in effect ultimately be prosecuted criminally. So, have we really decriminalized? I'm not entirely sure. Is it a last resort? Yes. Is it where we want to be? No. So, consequences for this are quite severe. 
you know, when it comes to money, we can say it's part of the cost of doing business. Um, particularly when it comes to anti-competitive behavior and you're dealing with billions of dollars. But issues around this here could be at least 10% of your annual turnover, or of course you're a juristic person, or you're in for up to 10 years if you are a natural person. So parties will be excluded from doing business, which of course perhaps could arguably be where it really hits you hardest. But what do we do if we forward? Well, firstly, importance in supply and development. We not only have to educate ourselves as to what these new codes and regulations actually are, but very importantly, we have to educate our higher education institutions as to why this is so important. That this isn't simply a tick box exercise. This isn't an add-on service. This isn't something which we simply must do because it's good and nice. It's an imperative. If we truly believe in social justice and the transformation of society, this is one of the key ways in which we could drive it on a national basis. Here we have to foster links. And I know as higher education institutions, we don't always communicate. We don't always share ideas. But the challenge perhaps, and what I hope from this particular conference, is that we will start talking. We will start sharing various experiences because we are in this together. Interestingly enough, of course, is that rely on PERCO and other structures which are there to support us. One of the interventions we did after the transformation summit immediately after, in fact, immediately after, literally within a week, is um, the fact that we actually hosted um, a specific workshop across all levels for the entire institution. From any particular staff member that wanted to come to middle senior um, management, and we literally did it on the king codes of corporate governance. And remember that I say part of the problem is the fact that we regulate and we control, and the fact that we have to work through this particular quagmire to find the nuances and the answers. If you could show me the PDF, please. And then we work through this, and I don't want to horrify you, but this basic spidergram. Okay. Oh. <laughs> could you make it larger? This is a snapshot of the King Codes of Corporate Governance in a nutshell. This literally is without any detail. This is literally just the most important points which may or may not be salient within corporate governance. This is the complexity of the dynamic of the work that we're actually working in and the environment that we're actually working in. However, the important fundamentals we have to take from this is that these principles of good corporate citizenship, I can share it with everyone afterwards if they want, Good corporate and ethical citizenship is, deep, is explained in express and explicit detail in this particular guideline. What we would recommend then is to see how we can marry these business ethical constructs, which are excellent guidelines for how we should actually project into the future, and marry that within the higher education dynamic. And then perhaps looking at true value, true social justice, and true sustainability, we can collectively find a path forward. Thank you very much.